apologize for the technical difficulties, but there we go. Uh, only the lectures, though, are being recorded, so we want to make sure you feel very comfortable in the breakout groups that are going to follow the presentations. Nothing is going to be recorded there, and your discussion is also not going to be recorded. We want to record the lectures so we can share them on YouTube later for you to rewatch and for other people who couldn't join today's workshop to also be able to have access to some of its content. We will share the links with you as soon as they're available on YouTube. The slides will also be made available for you after the workshop uh, as, as, as soon as we post them on Zenodo. If you have any questions during the workshop, please put them in the chat box and we will refer to them as soon as the presentation is over. So after each presentation, we'll have Q&A. Uh, make sure to ask your questions. If for some reason you didn't put it in the chat, after the presentation is over, over you can also unmute yourself and ask with the microphone. And we're also going to have a post-event feedback. You will see it in the chat. Uh, you can see the link in the chat afterwards. We'd really appreciate your feedback. I know we've, uh, with all those events uh, taking place online, it's always difficult to then follow up and give feedback, but we really appreciate We do take your feedback into consideration for our future events. So if you have five minutes or less, please fill out the form after the workshop. Uh, we're going to start with a short presentation of the project with the within the framework of which today's workshop is organized. It's a short project. Um, and we're following with three presentations of data citation practices. Like I mentioned before, each presentation will be followed by a Q&A. Uh, then after the Q&As are, are done and the presentations are uh, finalized as well, we're going to uh, go into the breakout rooms uh, for hands-on exercise. Our wonderful moderators today will guide you through the process, and we hope that we really will uh, help you understand uh, data citation practices a little bit more. And after the exercises, we're going to all bring back, uh, go back to the main room where we're going to discuss the exercise and any and all questions you might have that are left over from that exercise. So, without further ado, I would like to give you to give you a little bit more information about the project uh, that organizes this event today. Uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud, or what we call SHOCK, is the project with 45 partners uh, that, has, uh, start, that was started in uh, January 2019 and is planned for 40 months, so quite a long project. Um, the project is basically focusing, uh, I'm admitting people here, sorry, <laughs> Uh, very many people interested in today's event, so quite a few coming in still. The project is basically working on creating the social sciences and humanities part of the European Open Science Cloud, so EOS, right? So we're creating the infrastructure and the products that could be integrated in there that have to do with social sciences and humanities. Uh, another objective is maximizing reuse through open science and fair principles, standards, common catalogs, access control, semantic techniques, training, and such. Also focusing on interconnecting existing and new infrastructures, a clustered cloud infrastructure, and establishing appropriate governance models for uh, SSH EOS. So that's the few words about the project. We have quite a few uh, interesting impacts that we expect to achieve. Uh, social sciences and humanities are seamlessly integrated in the European Open Science Cloud, availability of an EU-wide, easy-to-use SSH open marketplace, where tools and data are openly accessible. EU-wide availability of high-quality cloud-ready SSH tools and high-quality SSH data. EU-wide availability of trusted and secure access mechanism for SSH data conforming to EU legal requirements. State-of-the-art research infrastructure in several pilot domains advanced through dedicated SSH data pilots cluster projects. And last but not least, maximizing, maximizing reuse through open science and fair principles. So those are the, uh, the expected impact of the project. And now uh, I wanted to give a quick introduction into what to expect next after this workshop. Uh, we have quite a few training available within the project that we're uh, providing constantly. You can follow the, the schedule on our website, of SHOCK website. The following one is coming up on June 23rd, and it's the workshop Shocking Data in the Cloud, Encoding Theatrical Text Collections and Added Value of Shock and Clarence Services. In September, we have two, one workshop and one webinar, the workshop on data protection and GDPR, and webinar showcase a survey for free on the EMM registry survey, survey registry. November will bring us the webinar on data citations, so follow up to this workshop. 
And the other events that might pop up or are going to be planned, you can follow on the uh, shop website in the link that is, you can see on the screen. Our speakers today, we have uh, four contributors and three speakers. Uh, Dieter von Outwank from Clarion Eric and Dieter, I well, apologize and probably did not pronounce your name correctly, but he will introduce himself later on as well. Uh, Pavel Stranak, uh, Lindat, Nicola Laros, uh, uh, Humanum uh, CNRS, and Michel Jacobson, uh, who was a contributor, but Nicola will be presenting on behalf of both of them today. Without further ado, I would like to not take away the time that we've prepared for our speakers and give the floor to Dieter with the first presentation for today. Dieter, I'm going to stop sharing so you can share your screen. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Tatiana. Um, just give me a second. I'll try to share my presentation. Should be able to see it now. And we can see it now, yes, full screen. Yes. There we are. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, yeah, it's my uh, pleasure today to give you a quick introduction on um, how to do data citation using uh, virtual collections. Um, <clears throat> as Tatiana already mentioned, and uh, I'm Dieter van Uitvank, uh, and I'm uh, working at uh, Claire and Eric. I'm technical director there. Um, and I won't um, do a large introduction today since I think we're in more kind of hands-on mode. So let's go into the uh, content immediately. Well, first a little word on what Claren is. Some of you might never heard of it. So it stands for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. It is a European research infrastructure uh, we have a legal entity called an ERIC um, that exists since 2012, and we're recognized as an ESRI landmark since uh, 2016. Now, what is Clarin doing? Uh, we're a distributed infrastructure, so we're a kind of collaboration of centers all over Europe and beyond, um, trying to provide easy and sustainable access for scholars in humanities and social sciences, so hence the link with uh, shock, um, to digital language data and to digital language tools. Data is a very broad uh, term in that sense, so it goes uh, from written over spoken recordings to video um, data sets, multi-model capturing of all kinds of uh, language expressions. Um, we also provide access to tools, uh, basically to analyze the language data that is also available. So that's to find out about the language data, it's to explore what the role is, um, to use it in certain contexts, to annotate it, enrich it, analyze it, combine it, uh, wherever the data are uh, located. <clears throat> And we're trying to do this with a very low uh, threshold, so in such a way that wherever uh, authorization, uh, authentication and authorization is needed, that you can use single sign-on. That also goes for the virtual collection registry that I will show you today. So it means that if you have a university account at uh, a European uh, academic institution, you should be able to use your own username and password to get access to uh, some of the services. Good, then uh, over to virtual collections. Um, virtual collection is um, a set, a coherent set of links to digital objects. Um, and uh, it's actually been created in order to address the question or the, or the, the, the need of people to cite um, a bit of a larger set of data links and where traditionally you can see that people are uh, for instance using either uh, official uh, citation snippet in a paper or a footnote to refer to some file um, or, or a, a bigger data set uh, the virtual collection tries to address that need but for a larger amount of links so suppose you have, uh, I don't know, 200, 300 links you want to share with colleagues, but you still want to have a kind of persistent link towards that set. Well, then a virtual collection could be uh, the right answer to your, uh, to your need. Um, the idea with virtual collections is that they need to be easily created, that they can be easily accessed and that they are easy to cite. So hence the link also with today's uh, topic. Um, 
And a very important feature of the links in a virtual collection is the fact that they can originate from different archives. And this relates a bit to the conceptual setup of uh, the Clarion infrastructure as distributed infrastructure. That also means that as a researcher, you might be using uh, a part of data from repository A, uh, a bit from repository B and a repository C. And those repositories can reside elsewhere or at different locations. Um, and and uh, with a virtual collection, it allows you to bundle such a link, uh, so, such links as a kind of coherent bookmark uh, set. Um, the idea is also that a virtual collection is suitable for manual access. So as a researcher, when, once you have clicked on, uh, say, uh, that footnote or that part of a paper that refers to the collection, you can inspect it manually. But the idea is also that uh, you can uh, process the data that is referred from that virtual collection in an automated way. So with, a, uh, for instance, a Python script or uh, from uh, some interactive notebook or so. Good, then uh, over to the actual implementation of virtual collections. So to, um, yeah, to, to make these virtual collections uh, accessible as a service, Clarin has launched the so-called virtual collection registry. And that's a kind of location where you can register and publish your uh, virtual uh, collections. Uh, now, what's the advantage of having such a service? Well, it comes as an easy to use package. Uh, your virtual collections uh, are uh, receiving a persistent identifier, a handle or uh, a DOI. Uh, the collections that you're publishing are also um, fair. So that means, for instance, to another service from Clarence Virtual Language Observatory, where you can then search through metadata descriptions, including virtual collections. Um, and there's some things on the horizon um, that will also um, be included in the virtual collection registry soon. Uh, one of them is automatic link checking. This is already taking place, but there's no automated reporting yet. So suppose you have a virtual collection of 10 links and two of those 10 links are uh, breaking or are not working anymore. Then the idea is that you as creator of that virtual collection will receive a notification by email, for instance, that your uh, links are broken, that you should take a look to replace them or to, uh, to fix them in one or the other way. And the other thing is um, also easy ways to process the linked uh, data entries. That's what I was already referring to, um, but it's still something that is in the work, so I cannot go into the details of that. It will be uh, uh, for sure um, be, be launched uh, relatively soon. Good, then um, maybe do some examples. And this is also the part where I hope to work a bit by example, because I can give long theoretic explanations, but I think it's much more interesting to see some examples in practice. So I will, uh, for this first uh, virtual collection, I will just click on this link and then uh, if everything goes well, a browser window should show up. Yeah, I hope you can see it. There it is. So this is an example virtual collection. Um, just to give a bit of background, I'll increase the font size a little bit so that you can hopefully read it better. Um, so this is the um, first example. It's being created as a supplementary material to a paper uh, from a researcher, Connie de Vos, who did research on sign language on the Isle of Bali. And in uh, addition to the paper that she wrote, she also published several video recordings of uh, uh, yeah, language interaction among the sign language community on, uh, that, uh, in that location. Uh, I can quickly show you the original paper. So this is a part of the paper. Uh, here you can see uh, a bit of the analysis and the, the annotations that you can see with it. And as you can see here, the videos in this case have been linked from footnotes. Now, what uh, we have done here is collecting these, what is it, uh, some, some seven... Uh, one, two, three, four, five videos, uh, and put them uh, as a bundle in a virtual collection together with um, a link to the original paper. So this is the paper that I already showed. And then next to that, there is also a link to the videos. So I can just open one of these links here, uh, put it a bit to the side, and then you end up in this case at the repository of the uh, language archive at the Max Planck Institute in, uh, in Nijmegen. And then from here on, you can access the video. So I think I have one uh, open here. Here it is. Should be able to see it. Uh, just to give an idea, but this is a kind of illustration then, yeah, the raw material that is then being analyzed and uh, uh, annotated in the paper. Uh, 
Um, so using this virtual collection, it's actually possible to easily share um, that uh, exactly described set of, uh, of uh, data files, in this case, the video files. Uh, what is also actually quite nice to see is the way it has been included in the repository where the paper was published. So here you can see the pure repository of the Max Planck Society. And indeed here you see a link to the uh, PDF uh, paper. You see a bit of metadata, citation snippets, uh, information about the researcher. And here you can see that the um, virtual collection was actually linked as supplementary material. So if you click here, then you will go towards the uh, virtual collection. And this is a nice way because then you have um, to, to use a virtual collection because then you have it's kind of bi-directional uh, pointers. So you have a link from the paper uh, and the repository towards the virtual collection and also the other way around. If you go to the virtual collection, if you find it, you can easily jump back to the paper. And I think that's a very good practice uh, to, to make this kind of linking uh, as convenient as possible. Good, that was the first example. Let me go to a second example. Um, this is actually a bit uh, inspired by um, a societal discussion that uh, took place last year when the, the whole COVID uh, pandemic started. And there was a whole discussion in the, uh, in the Dutch press about the use of face masks and so. And at a certain point, uh, I should open the virtual collection, at a certain point, one of the, the directors of the Institute uh, of uh, of uh, the health uh, ministry um, basically stated like, okay, but there's already a lot of research being done on, um, on face masks and, and contamin contaminations and things like that. So at a certain point, the, the person stated like, oh, well, you can just search for face mask and influenza in the, the PubMed repository, which is a repository for medical uh, papers. Um, what we did at that point as a kind of illustration um, is made, we made a kind of um, snapshot of the papers that that query resulted at, uh, at that very moment. And uh, in the end, that were some, what is it, 145 links to papers and PubMed. I can uh, just click on one to give you an example how the links uh, look like. Um, there it is. And so these are basically landing pages in, um, in PubMed, which is a specialized uh, repository. And the advantage of this is actually that um, rather than having some kind of uh, prose message like, okay, uh, you could have searched for this term in PubMed uh, on this date. You can make it more uh, replicable. So we have a, a fixed set here and everyone, even uh, two, three years later, can still get access to the exact uh, uh, set of links as they were found at the time. And for instance, what you also could imagine is that you then in the later stage do some processing on the papers that are uh, referred uh, from from this list. So it's also a way of kind of making a kind of time-based snapshot of certain queries and to make that then uh, accessible afterwards. So that's for the second example. Let me go back to the example list. Uh, third one is actually one a bit closer to, uh, to our uh, home uh, today, uh, so to say. Um, and that's an example of a tutorial that was uh, given earlier on in the shock um, uh, in the, the, the shock context. Uh, and what we saw there is that there were kind of different things that were being cited that were still connected to each other, but that didn't have a single pointer towards it. So in this case it was a training session which had a web page on the shock uh, page. There was a YouTube recording of a movie and there was a presentation that was linked as a PDF in the Zenodo repository. Now with virtual collections, you can just create one single uh, persistent identifier that allows you to cite all three of those elements with one um, URL. And so from that perspective, uh, also, for instance, you could think uh, of this as an easy way of conveying a small set of re relevant links. Um, you could, for instance, even using uh, use it in, in Twitter or in social media communication, then you have this very uh, short and, and simple um, uh, URL persistent identifier that you can, uh, can share. Um, so this is just a third uh, very practical example of how virtual collections could be used. Let me go back to the presentation. Um, then how to cite it? Well, there are multiple ways in uh, the virtual collection registry how you can uh, get access to the citation information. The first one is the cite button. So you can see that actually over here, if you click it, then you will get a modal pop-up with a bit of information and you also will get the BIPTEC snippet. So this is something that you could then 
uh, automatically include in uh, your reference manager or in a, a BibTeX file, for instance. Second option is if you have a browser plugin uh, in combination with your reference manager, then you could use uh, that one. So uh, for instance, for the newer um, uh, virtual collections, DOI will be created automatically. And it also means that for instance, Sodero will then recognize it and will gather that bit of metadata information automatically from uh, the DOI uh, ecosystem and ingested them in your reference manager. So it saves you the hassle of entering the, the author name or also to search for that individual site button on the web page. It's always there on the same location. You click on it and it gets recognized. Finally, a third option of doing this is um, quite similarly, but without the browser plugin, where you basically copy and paste uh, the DOI uh, reference that you find for a virtual collection. And uh, if, for instance, here I've taken the example of Zotero, you click on this magical addition button, you enter the persistent identifier, and then the metadata will be included uh, automatically in your, um, in your reference manager. Um, yeah, and that basically brings me to the end of the presentation. <coughs> if you have, um, if you're curious and want to see more about the virtual collections, take a look and uh, visit our uh, website. Um, there you can find a bit more information. You also find a link to uh, collections.clarin.eu and some, <coughs> sorry, and some uh, further uh, information. Yeah, and that basically is the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you very much. If there are Thank questions, much, I'll be Peter. happy to take them. Thanks very much. We have uh, two questions so far uh, based on your presentation. Uh, one question is from Rebecca Grant. Uh, is there a limit on what can be linked from the virtual collection? For example, only digital objects in certain repositories. Um, no, there is no limit. So you, everything that anything that has a URL can be cited in the virtual collection. And even things that don't have a URL uh, should in theory be possible to be linked. So there is an option of adding also queries. You could, for instance, imagine uh, that in a certain uh, corpus query system, you have a very detailed query that you want to share. It's a kind of textual expression, could be five to 10 lines, for instance. And it is possible to create a virtual collection that just has that query in it. It has a specific uh, type that you then can specify upon the creation. Uh, but to, to, to return to the question, um, no, there is no limit of uh, what can be uh, added to a virtual collection. Great, thanks. Uh, a question from Cyril Pestel, how to choose between a resource proxy and a virtual collection for a corpora proposed of a few text uh, audio files? Mm -hmm. It's the, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to get a bit. So this has to do with the granularity and what to add to a virtual collection. Um, and this depends a bit on the exact needs. So uh, on the one hand, um, there are general guidelines uh, in, in as best practices for citations where people say, well, you should be citing, say, a landing page with a persistent identifier that goes to a specific repository. That's perfectly possible to add to a, uh, uh, virtual collection. Uh, however, at this point, it also means that you will basically get something that is mainly intended for human consumption, namely a landing page. Um, in addition to that, it is also possible to have direct references to digital objects, say to a PDF or uh, a video MPEG-4 uh, file. If you do that, then you will have direct access to that. So it is a bit better suited for um, machine uh, actionability, but it won't lead you through the landing page. Uh, and then there's also a third option, and this is something uh, that I was referring to, like it's in the work currently, and that is a kind of um, possibility of um, performing machine actionability actions on something that is linked from a landing page. And we're currently working on a kind of uh, yeah, a bit of software that is able to recognize that a landing page is, for instance, coming from a Zenodo repository or a DSpace repository, and that then, based on that little bit of information, can um, make the pieces that are described machine actionable. Um, I realize it's maybe a bit of a technical discussion, so I, I, if there's this detailed questions, I'm definitely willing to follow up offline, uh, but it might guide us a bit uh, too far to... to um, get in the nitty gritty details of this. Yeah. Uh, so Thanks a lot. We have one more last question uh, from Errol Natson, who is wondering who can create a collection. 
Yeah, so anyone, uh, any academic uh, user and even beyond that uh, can uh, can create collections. So if you go to the virtual collection registry, you log in with your academic credentials, you can, you're ready to go. So you can uh, publish a virtual collection there. If you don't have um, uh, academic credentials, you can apply for a so-called Claren account. Um, and then with that credentials, you can log in and make a publication to the virtual collection registry. Thank you very much, Dieter, for, the Q for your answers and for a wonderful presentation. Moving on, oh, we have one more. Let's give it one more, one more question. Based on the example, citations seem to give author, uh, authorship of all links included in the collection to the person creating the collection. Is that good practice? Yeah, so what is important, I think, uh, is to um, to have clear agreement with the people who have been creating the uh, the data sets. And first of all, it is possible to have multiple uh, authors as part of a virtual collection. So you could, um, if, if, say, you have... Uh, uh, like data stemming from three different researchers, you can make them co-authors uh, of or, or creators of that virtual collection. Uh, and for the general practice, it really will depend a lot on the on the on the use and and the practical uh, implementation and creation of virtual collections. So it's very clear that. Uh, uh, the, the possibilities of creating virtual collections doesn't mean you should hijack someone else's data and put your name on it. So that's a very uh, important thing to do. And um, it's, it's something I think that is very important to keep in mind, uh, but it's also something where the technology uh, cannot prevent such hijacking, so to say. So it's really important here to give the right credits to be very clear about the fact that something is just a virtual collection, that it is not the original data, and that you are uh, referring to that. Thank you very much, Dieter. Uh, let's move on to our next presentation and our presenter, Pavel Straniak. Uh, Pavel, the floor is yours. We can see your, um, your presentation full screen. Thank you. But we cannot hear you. Uh, Sorry, Pavel, I think you're muted. Yeah. I was speaking. I was speaking, but I was muted. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Pavel Straniak. I'm from Charles University, and we are part of the Clarion Consortium. Just like, like did the things we work on the repository systems and on one to show you how it will get you a message that putting data to a repository is a good thing. So let's say we want to make data easy to cite and now we are facing the question of how to do it and, and then, then an easy follow-up question of how to find those citations that possibly might exist. Um, okay, so let's say that we want to make data easily citable, and for a citation to make sense, the data has to be stable. I'm changing, I'm changing data set, and the reference to it must also be stable. So we need stable data set and a stable reference to it. And the solution seems to be a repository system with a persistent identifier system, because the repository makes the data stable. It's like uh, putting a book into a library it becomes kind of a, you know managed by the librarians and you cannot you cannot take it back you can maybe borrow it but but you cannot you know remove it from the library easily so that's the, the same thing with the repository and our solution our particular solution is is at this uh, at this link i posted here just you know you can look at it later and um, the deposit the procedure is is also described there in some document Basically, it's a very simple thing. You fill in a web form. We still see only the first slide. Uh, you haven't moved it, or is there? An yeah, yeah, I still haven't moved it. Okay, perfect. Uh, Thanks. Sorry, you see, you see this slide or that slide? Has it moved now? Uh, no, it has not moved. We only see oh. the introductory slide. So sorry, that 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 is indeed a problem. Um, huh? Has it moved we can it see now? now? We can see it now. Now we can see it more. Okay. Easy. Okay, okay, that's the thing I didn't know about Zoom. When I move this presentation from one monitor to another, it stops, it stops moving. Okay, so I've been talking about this slide for a moment now. Uh, we've chosen the repository, is this one, and, um, 
And the deposit procedure basically is a web form. You fill it with form, you drag and drop data set, you click the submit button and you're done. You can go party. Your data is preserved and citable. And uh, the data gets a persistent identifier that makes a URL just like Dieter was showing before, um, a handle in our, in our particular case. And it always lead to, uh, leads to the same metadata and the information, which is the information about data. It's stable in the sense that the identifier doesn't change, but also in the sense that the metadata doesn't change, except maybe for small typos. But whenever we need to make a bigger change, even in metadata, but definitely, definitely if there is a change in data, there's a new version of the same data set created. Um, it gets new identifiers, so it's a new citation. That's, that's a very important aspect. Um, the type of repository system we use is called ClarinB space. It's not so important now, um, only for those technically oriented uh, who want to set up repository systems, I put the information here. DSpace is basically a very popular out of the box thing that you don't have to do anything about. And we've modified it to, to serve as a nice repository for data rather than publications. Um, it's deployed in, in quite a few centers. So we are just one of those. And um, this, is, this is what the web form looks like when I said that basically making a new, new submission is very easy. So it, it's a form like this that asks you, you know, for names of authors. And, and if it was published before, then give us the publisher and date and things like that. And in a few steps, you describe the data set and then you upload data files, drag and drop them into the form, set up a license, uh, choose a license for the data and push a button and then you're done. If you need to make a new submission, then this is how it's done. You just uh, log in, see the submissions that you have made before and you say, oh, for this one, I have, a, I have a new version. And it copies everything from the previous submission and you just make the modifications, you know, give it a new number in the name and, and change the description to say what's new, drag and drop new files, and you are done in a minute. Um, yes, but in order to, to cite data, we actually have to find the data first. And this is an interesting aspect that I think the repository helps a lot with because the repository can do a lot of work in the kind of, you know, invisible to the end user. It can provide metadata in many ways. It can do so-called CEO search engine optimizations uh, basically to make your data prominently visible in search engines and in all the important places. So this is just an example of what Clarin DSpace does in the kind of, you know, behind the scene. So it makes optimizations for Google and, and specifically also for Google scholars. I will show you in a moment what it looks like. Uh, it makes, uh, we've changed it to make optimizations also for Google dataset search, which is a new search engine specifically for data sets. It provides metadata in a, some specific format. It provides metadata in an, another specific format for Clarion Virtual Language Observatory and yet another format uh, to be integrated in open air, which is, you know, kind of a monitoring of research outputs of uh, European projects. Um, different format for data citation index uh, of Clarivate Analytics. You can see that many providers basically want, or many services want metadata in their own specification. And it's just a good thing to do it, you know, not argue with them, just give them what they need. And then your data becomes very, very nicely visible. This is just a schematic, you know, of some integrations of, of our repository system. There's also some B2 find service, which is kind of generic uh, data set uh, search um, in some European project. And there are definitely a few more. Um, this is what it looks like, uh, technically speaking. So uh, in the top part of the, of the window, you can see uh, our repository and some data set called Robocheck uh, base. And um, in the, at the bottom, you can see the HTML code of that web page. And you can see there are some strange elements, meta name, DC creator, and so on. So this part, these, these elements, are, um, that's optimization for Google metadata. Uh, it just lists um, those important elements you can see also on the web page when you see authors and the list of authors. Then you can see these authors also in the code um, in a slightly different form, you know, uh, one by one. 
And that's an, that, this is a specific optimization, for instance, for Google Scholar to nicely list all the authors and to give credit to each and every of those authors and so on. Um, this is the same, still the same data set and uh, metadata, basically the same metadata just listed in a slightly different way. And this specifically is, is an optimization for Google data set uh, search uh, engine. That was just to show you that, you know, the repository system can do quite a lot of useful things. You could do them on your homepage if you put data on your homepage, but you can see that would be quite a bit of work. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of making data um, nicely citable, making them visible. And uh, the other aspect is actually to provide nice, uh, nice uh, citation formats. Uh, Dieter was showing it before. So this is similar thing. Follow the so-called force 11 data citation principles. We provide uh, formatted text. You can just copy paste into Word or other word processors or a big tech record uh, as, as Dieter was showing in the virtual collection registry. That's nice for people who typeset their papers or books in, in LaTeX, uh, LaTeX format. This is what it looks like in practice on the web page uh, of a different data set called Eltalon. Uh, there's, this, um, there's this formatted text citation uh, useful for word processors. You just copy paste it and, 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 and that's it. Or you can, you can have this big tech for, for LaTeX users, as I said before. Um, now the interesting aspect of, um, does it work really? Do, do you get any citations? You know? um, and we tried to look at Google Scholar and, and publish it perish or perish. And it was very simplistic search. We just looked for Lindat um, key name as our repository. And then we counted citations and we got some thousands. Then we removed preprints and self citations. And, and then we removed everybody who was even employed on the project as a kind of you know, indirect sales citation. So, it, and, and we were pretty strict about it. And this is the, these are the numbers that we got from our repository. For reference, the repository has some maybe 500 records, maybe yeah, no, maybe three, 400 records so that actually include data. Um, so I don't know, I leave it up to you whether this is a big or small number, but uh, there are definitely some citations. Um, many say, like everywhere else, the distribution is such that most data sets uh, we were not able to find citations for, and for some data sets, there are quite a few. Um, there's definitely room for improvement. One of them is that the handle system itself um, is not as easy to work with for data citations or for, for citations in general as the DOIs. And I heard it's kind of a rumor thing that there might be a um, you know, light uh, in front of us that the DOI system might change uh, so as to provide their own services like Crossref, and, and alt matrix uh, for also other persistent identifiers who do not start with 10 dot. So, so our handlers could theoretically, hopefully in future, have all those services of DOIs. We would definitely appreciate that if it was possible because then citations are easier to find and, and formatting of citations is easier to, done, to do. And, um, but we can do something uh, regardless. So if we, um, Dieter was showing the Zenodo, sorry, the Zotero integration. So the bibliographic uh, database system thingy. And we can improve that. It works with our repository system out of the box, but it doesn't work perfectly. So some attributes are not copied perfectly with that magic button. And we could make sure that they are copied perfectly. If we, when I showed you the, you know, the JSON format that is provided for you know, this thing that is provided for Google data set uh, search metadata. So basically similar thing, but slightly different. If we edit that into our web page, then it would, uh, sorry, then it would work very well with Zotero and with Mendeley and other bibliography management systems. It would also allow us to use some JavaScript library to provide uh, citation styles, you know, hundreds of citation styles. So, so we'll probably do that in the future. Um, 
Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, we have one question from Christina. You mentioned that before citing data, uh, data should be accessible. Don't you think that citing data should not only be done by users of secondary data, but also by primary researchers? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch the last part of, of your last sentence, basically. Don't you think that citing data should not only be done by users of secondary data, but also by primary researchers? Hmm. Maybe I don't understand correctly how it's meant, because uh, I would say yes, definitely everybody should cite the data they use. That's very simple, whether they are do primary research or, or not. But at the same time, um, the data to be cited, uh, it has to be um, accessible. I, I, by accessible, I don't mean um, I don't mean that everybody has to have access without any conditions. But it doesn't make sense to cite data that um, nobody can verify that even exists or that it is stable and so on. So I would argue that data has to be first, let's say, finished in some in some in some stable state or a snapshot if it's uh, if it's dynamic data, and that's that's basically a reproducibility question. So unless it is reproducible, I don't really see a use case for citing it. Does it make sense, Christina? Does that answer your question? You can also feel free to unmute yourself uh, if you would like to clarify something. Yes, hi. Yeah, uh, I think I think data could be put in a repository by primary researchers, and they have they could maybe add a, a deadline uh, for it not to be uh, publicly available, but still there, so they can cite their data. I think it would be very uh, good practice, and uh, that that researchers uh, cite data and I'm working in a, in a repository in Switzerland and um, I, I think that uh, it will help also researchers <laughs> to deposit their data uh, at the end and, and to make available their data. Ah, maybe maybe now I understand you better, thank you. Um, that's definitely possible. So, so uh, actually our repository and definitely a few others we make sure to, to provide the persistent identifier to the depositors even before they finish the submission. And that's, very, that's pretty important because usually the publishing of data is linked with writing a paper and so on. So to make a submission of the paper, you know, a few months in advance before it is really published, the data is usually still, you know, being finalized and they are already making the submission, uh, submission deadline for a conference and so on. So, so that's what that's what we do. That the link, the persistent identifier, uh, even you know, with the citation and everything, it's available before the submission is finished. So they can they can publish a paper about the data, and then have then they then they can still have some time to finish finish the submission uh, and so on. Yes, but I think we should push the researchers and uh, the journals to to include data citation in every article that uh, employ empirical data. That's, that's my opinion, at least. Oh yeah, that's the, that's the question of journal policies. And I think they are slowly getting there. So if, um, more and more journals uh, and, and also conferences like, uh, like ACL conferences in, in my field of view, that's um, a field of study, that's uh, Association for Computational Linguistics. They actually starting to require data. So, um, so in the submission, the data set has to be part of it. Or if it's not required, then, then it gives you still some, some benefit in, you know, if, if you do not uh, add the data, maybe they will not disqualify you, but, uh, but it, will, it will lower your ch chances of, uh, of acceptance. So I think, I think that's, that's the right way. Yeah, I agree. Thank you very much, Christina, for your question. And thank you very much, Pavel, for a wonderful presentation and uh, for making sure you answer. Uh, we have one more question for you. Do you have standards for citing data? Do citation style guides address the issue? Journals often do not provide guidance, I fear, says Radim Kladik. Sorry, uh, once again, I wasn't, uh, I didn't yeah. quite clearly hear the first sentence. So uh, do we the have standards? For citing data, 
Do yeah. citation style guides address the issue? And journals often yeah. do not provide guidance. Um, very interesting question. Uh, so in, I would say yes and no. Uh, uh, citation guidelines, uh, I, I quoted this one, sorry, first 11 data citation principles uh, with, this, uh, with this DOI. Uh, if, you, if you follow this link, then uh, you will get to a um, guideline that specifies this is a very generic guideline, but then there is a there is also I think link to a more direct uh, implementation that shows which uh, attributes, which parts uh, should be present uh, in a data citation. Um, for instance, that it, that there should be a, a repository where the data set is uh, is stored. So so if you look here, then these uh, this actually follows the data citation uh, guidelines. So this and that, it, it both follows the data citation guidelines. There should be a title, author, URL, and the URL must be a persistent identifier. And there must be um, name of the repository where it is stored, and there should be a license and a year. So that's, that's basically a summary of the, of, of the, of the current uh, guidelines for data citation. And these guidelines are followed by the various FAIR, um, projects and uh, and so on. I think I think they are basically quite sensible guidelines. A small problem is then with the you know when you are really making the citation and the, the journal says uh, you have to use uh, APA style or something, and and you find out that the APA style provides for DOI but doesn't provide for other uh, other URLs or something like that. Then, then sometimes you have to be a bit creative, and, and I agree that that that, um, that should be rectified. Thank you very much, Pavel. I think on this we're going to end the Q and A for your presentation. Thanks a lot for everyone who asked the questions. Thanks, Pavel, and we're going Thank to you. pass the floor uh, to Nicola Laros, who will uh, finalize our presentations with yes. Nicola, the floor is yours. You're muted. Uh, we see your presentation now. Yes, great. So hello, I'm uh, Nicolas Larousse uh, from, uh, you can guess that I'm French is my name. And uh, I'm working at Humanum. Humanum is a French infrastructure dedicated to SSH. That means that uh, we provide services to uh, all researchers, all projects mainly and uh, different type of services from uh, simple hosting, uh, preservation, but also more, the more sophisticated tools like now deep learning tools and this kind of thing. And on the other hand, we, we have also uh, um, a way to, uh, to fund people to work on the same scientific object. We call that consortium. And uh, that means that people, we, we can find people to work on 3D, for instance, and work on 3D standards and this kind of thing. And we also uh, we are we are also doing things at uh, European level, and we are coordinating, for instance, the, particip the French participation in Clarin and uh, in Daria as well. So this is um, more or less quickly uh, what we are doing in Emmanuel. I'm not there to speak about Humanum, but uh, we are going to speak about Cocoon. Cocoon is a French repository dedicated to rural resources. And it's uh, rapidly, it was created in 2006. And uh, there are two laboratories that are managing the content and managing the policies and so on. There are, as you can see, maybe you don't understand French, but they are very orient language oriented, of course. And it's hosted by Humanum, and it was uh, labeled as a Clarin Center in 2015. What can you find in Cocoon? Uh, you can find oral data for SSH in France. That doesn't mean there is only French, you can find only French resources, or resources in French maybe, but mostly French resources. That come from uh, that can, came from different projects, different uh, different uh, parts of uh, the research in France. Uh, it can come from uh, CNRS, but from universities, from uh, 
abroad and so on. And you can find recordings, you can find, uh, so this is a specificity maybe of all the sources. You can find different type of annotation, like transcriptions, which are really important in this kind of um, field. Translation, of course, and uh, more, uh, it's more less common, some uh, measure, for instance, some measure of your uh, ECC, uh, the measure of a, uh, when you read the text, for instance, and you you have uh, you can measure the electricity uh, that uh, circulates uh, on your uh, on your head and this kind of thing. So you have different possibility of associ to associate different resources to for research project regarding their needs. The metadata are expressed mainly in NOLAC. NOLAC is a standard based on the Dublin Core. It's an extended Dublin Core uh, specifically for uh, oral resources. So you can, for instance, for uh, uh, you can uh, you can specify that uh, uh, someone is speaking, who is speaking, who is recording, who is uh, doing uh, the project, and this kind of thing. So it's more precise that uh, Dublin Core. Uh, people in Cocoon, they are doing very uh, extended curation because when you publish in Cocoon, it's uh, very specific for other resources. So you need to have a very, very important curation about uh, reference sources, the way you specify uh, the language, of course, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, Cocoon provides a tribal store, which is not very uh, innovative, but it's still useful and more. Uh, less common, again, uh, everything that you put in uh, Cocoon is preserved at CINES. CINES is a data center in France, which mission is to preserve research data on the long term, that means 20 years or something like that. So this is what Cocoon can do for you uh, in general and can do for you if you are a researcher. And uh, rapidly, there are about 40,000 recordings, 250 languages, so you can see the map. Huh? You have languages from uh, everywhere in the world, and more or less 5,000 hours of uh, recording. Uh, this, you have a web interface, of course, and a search engine in Cocoon, but uh, there are a lot of data that are reused by other projects. For instance, uh, cultural, uh, you have on the left, you have something which then is a trésor de la parole. That means that you take some resources from uh, Cocoon and then you present them in a nice way for uh, more, uh, not from researcher, but from uh, for uh, citizens uh, to explain what kind of languages do, do we speak in French. In France, for instance, we don't only speak French, but we, we speak a lot of different, a lot of different uh, languages regionally or sometimes in different communities. So this is a way to create, to reuse uh, data from a core. But the subject today is not about what you can do with Cocoon, but what you can do with citation and Cocoon. And uh, so, as it was uh, stated by the different uh, presentation before, you Cocoon provides PIDs and a lot of different PIDs. Why PIDs, uh, this PID, for instance, the first one, of course, is a DUI. Uh, it's quite recent. I think uh, Michel Jacobson, who is in charge of the technical part of the repository, implemented that very recently. But, you know, it's uh, very useful, as Pavel said, that you, you have a lot of tools associated now with uh, DUI, so it's uh, very useful. I said that <clears throat> we are also doing some long-term preservation in long-term preservation world, they are using specific uh, PIDs that are ARC, it's from uh, archive. So CINES provides some ARC uh, PIDs, so we use that also because it's a, it's a way to, uh, to inform that this resource is accessible at CINES with this kind of um, PID. So it's for different needs, for different purposes. And uh, we use Perl, uh, yes, it's uh, an, old, an old PID, but mainly we use Perl to uh, resolve, uh, you know, what we use uh, for the OAI identifiers. And uh, so it's another way because it's 
also a different need for different communities that use OEI, like OLAC, for instance. And before, there were also others. So you have quite uh, some PIDs in Cocoon. Um, and to what kind of resources do we put PIDs? Of course, we put PIDs from collection, from recording, and as I said before, for annotations that are linked to recording, which in turn are links to collections. So you have different kinds of objects, may I say, digital objects, and there are links expressed in Cocoon uh, between these objects. And of course, you have different PIDs. So how can you cite, uh, for instance, a recording? Uh, now we have DOI, so we can use this kind of uh, services that are provided by the DOI community. For instance, there is a, and we are going to use that in the hands-on exercises. We are using a, a website a service, a web service, which name is CrossSite. You know, uh, it's between uh, DataSite and CrossRef. Huh? They, uh, they have done that to resolve DOI. And you can provide, uh, I think, 100 of different kind of uh, citation. So we choose some, the main one in, in our world, in the world of oral resources, huh? APA. So we are going to deal with that uh, in another. Um, and other exercises, but also uh, it was mentioned before BIPTEX and Chicago, which was very popular in a certain uh, communities. So directly, you know, if you have a DOI, you publish your DOI, you publish DOI with metadata, you have some recommendation from data site to publish uh, data sets. And this is the beginning of an answer for the previous question. Do we have a standard to, to cite uh, data set. There are no standards, as Pavel said, but you know, there are some recommendations from APA, uh, for instance, to how to provide a proper citation for the data set. Those so they have, they have some, uh, may say, keywords to add a, a proper description of the data set. And so we can provide that directly from uh, the the repository as, as a service, so you can copy paste in your uh, in your repository in your uh, paper, for instance, or in your uh, in your publication. So this is what Cocoon provide, uh, which is quite normal nowadays. But also, you know, in this kind, of, and this is what I wanted to. Uh, this is what, the reason why I wanted to present Cocoon because there were there are also some needs for this kind of uh, community of oral resources to uh, cite a part of the recording. So it was. It's not very stable. Right? It's uh, it's more a proof and concept than a real service because it's a little bit fragile. May I say? But we use a specification from W3C for uh, what they call media fragments. So it's, uh, it's not really a standard, but it's a recommendation from W3C. So it's quite stable. And so you can use, in our case, you can use uh, other tags, but in, in, our, in our case, we wanted to use temporal tags. And as you can see, you just put after the DUI some Oops, sorry. Some more information about the tag, the beginning of uh, the recording that you want to cite and the end of the recording. So you have two examples there, one with DOI, one with a POI, uh, a Perl, and then this is the same way to, uh, to cite a part of a recording. So, how does it work? Uh, I can do, even I can do if I have time uh, a presentation. So here I ask to cite from second four to second nine. And you know, when you open the resource, you have what? You have uh, your uh, player is directly positioned on uh, the second four, and then is going to play that until the second nine. So this is a way to cite uh, part of the recording. Cocoon also provides some other possibilities to uh, to cite, and uh, you know you can use specifiers. It's, it came from uh, the Arc world mainly, so you can also 
provide some more uh, specifiers. That means that you, you, you can provide some, some more information. So you can see here, for instance, you can specify version of the recording. And there, here we have that in, a, in a, directly in the DOI. And we also, you can also provide some uh, other versions. For instance, you have a version for preservation and a version for diffusion. So you can specify that with, uh, with a specific uh, attribute in a way, a specifier. It doesn't work very well with DOI, I may say, but with Perl, for instance, it works perfectly. So it was quite short, but the idea was to show and to introduce the undone exercises that uh, you know you have sometimes you have the need for different levels of granularity of citation. Maybe sometimes you want to refer to a whole data set. That mean in this case in a cocoon it's a collection. Sometimes you want to refer only for to the recording. So uh, this is uh, the, the audio files or video file, for instance. Sometimes you want to refer to the annotation and sometimes you want to refer to the a fragment of a recording or a fragment of an annotation you can do that also and sometimes you want to refer to the version a specific version but you know this is still the same object in different contexts and to finish this is one of the benefits and we are going to insist on that during the and then exercises and uh, also at the end of the, the session the benefits of putting your data in a repository, you have a lot of services associated with the repository and specifically some um, precise service of a uh, citation. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Um, do we have any questions? So far, we don't have any questions in chat, which is fantastic because then we can move on to our practical exercises. But I'm going to give it one more minute for people who have not typed in their question or who would like to unmute themselves and ask the question to please do so. So it was clear or I lost. Uh, ah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> A two perfect presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, I will give the floor to Dieter to explain the practical exercise before we move on to the actual breakout groups. So please, Dieter, unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so as, uh, as announced, um, in the next part, uh, we will try to do some uh, interactive uh, and small activities exercise on the topic of uh, data citation. Uh, we will soon uh, split up in uh, three subgroups and then uh, each of those groups will get the same exercises. Um, we'll try to solve those exercises in something like 15 minutes and then we come back to the main plenary room here to discuss a bit uh, how the exercises went and if there are any specific uh, insights that uh, came up during uh, during the, um, yeah, the execution of the exercises. Uh, now, what is the uh, questions that we are asking and where uh, Dan and Nicola and I will be trying to uh, give some, some hands-on support if there are questions. This is basically to provide data citations for three specific data sets that we have uh, pre-selected. Um, and the idea is that you create uh, either a BibTeX uh, entry or an APA uh, citation uh, fragment for those three data sets. Um, we also have a, a Google Doc where you can then um, put in your answers. And then, um, yeah, as I said, uh, at the end of the uh, breakout uh, groups, we'll uh, come back to the main room and do a re, uh, short evaluation and recap of the, uh, yeah, the insights. That's basically it. I think uh, we can uh, now uh, move into the uh, separate uh, breakout groups. Uh, groups. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then I will. You will be automatically assigned to a group. Uh, I will do this right now, and you will automatically join. Welcome back, then, <laughs> Hannah. Uh, you're still uh, muted, so we can't hear you. Can you put me back in the other room? I left inadvertently. Uh, sure, Thank but you. everybody's back in 20 seconds. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, Pavel, sorry. And <laughs> in order, uh, to finish my story, there was something uh, wrong with this solution too. If you look well, there is no uh, URI and there is no, uh, uh, there is no, still no corpus identifier. And uh, if, you, if you use a citation like this, uh, you are uh, dependent on having a good search facility to find uh, back what corpus you were actually looking at. Yeah, just for everybody, we are just finishing some conversation from the breakout room. <laughs> That's a good way to uh, actually move into our next uh, uh, seven minutes of the event and maybe have a bit of a roundup of what was discussed in the breakouts. Uh, breakouts. Dan, maybe you would like to continue with it. Yeah, so um, the, 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 we first looked at the Zenoda one, and uh, that looks good, uh, of the much used, etc. And uh, when comparing it to the to the second one, uh, Pavel, who is responsible, in fact, for uh, that part of the uh, uh, the repository uh, system, uh, you were you implemented it, right, Pavel, the citation facility? No, it wasn't me. It was it was my colleague, but uh, but I know how it is done. So. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Pavel was uh, graciously saying that the uh, Zenodo one was uh, more powerful in the sense that it was more versatile. So I suspect we can expect such uh, versatility in his uh, repository system also um, in the um, in the future. Um, so yeah, I, I can I can say two sentences about it. Zenodo functionality is really nice if you look at the first link, right? Mm -hmm. Because it gives you. Uh, two things. It gives you support for very, very many uh, formatted uh, text styles that you just copy paste if you are not using any bibliographic manager. And it also gives you uh, export into many formats uh, of various bibliographic managers. Yep. And I suspect that all of it is done by basically by one step. Uh, they support one format uh, of data under the hood, which is called uh, Siteproc uh, or Siteprox, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Okay. Another thing that we noticed was the difference between uh, BibTeX and uh, the API uh, citation uh, recommendations. Uh, BibTeX gives you the full list of uh, authors, which in the second case is a long one, uh, while EPA um, allows you to uh, abbreviate uh, the, the authors list. Uh, which is uh, perhaps not that informative, but it's more, how do you say, easy on the eyes when you have to uh, read uh, publications uh, with uh, citations. So it's more friendly for humans. Yeah. It's an important thing to, uh, um, to note. And then the last one, that's of course, uh, you will have noticed uh, that it does not have an automatic uh, citation function. So what to do? I don't know what you how, how you solved it, uh, but uh, I kind of uh, knew the solution, or at least the suggested solution, and we discussed that. But the suggested solution too does not offer a global identifier for the corpus, and it does not have the URI or the link to the uh, to the data uh, included. Uh, and there you come in the, um, how do you say, you, you, you get tempted to cite the data, not so much as data, uh, as, as the corpus, but to cite it as a website. Because there are recommendations how to cite websites, and there you find the URI is included. So that's much more easy for uh, users that want to relocate uh, the data itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Nicola and Dieter, do you have anything uh, uh, to add to this? I realize we have uh, very little time left, but please um, go ahead and unmute yourself and add. I don't have anything because we had, we had the same uh, questioning and the same answers. The last one is very good in a way that it's very well described, but uh, not very useful. Or we need a lot of work to to try to cite uh, information. And as Dan said, even you, it's difficult to, to retrieve data in your citation because you don't have a proper URL. I also, uh, in my group, we are also have, have time to, uh, to mention, for instance, uh, resources for the New York Times that are in GitHub. And uh, 
So we mentioned that we can use this uh, Zotero, Zotero tool, for instance, uh, that uh, can grab information from the landing page, even in GitHub or in Lindat, for instance, it works perfectly, Pavel. And uh, so you have, if you have proper metadata embedded in your uh, landing page, you can use a lot of tools, different tools, most uh, mainly uh, Zotero, which is um, most well known, but you have a lot of tools and you can develop also tools to do that. And DOI now with the DOI formatter, it's quite easy. Thanks very much, Dieter. And you would, would you like to add anything? Uh, I think I should give the prize for creativity for the solution to the third uh, exercise where uh, some of the participants would just be giving a phone call to the original authors to get the <laughs> bibliographic information. Wow. found that a very creative solution. Um, no, no, no really further uh, observations. In fact, that the second one can be relatively long, but that it's more, it's a feature, it's not, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It's really on purpose that all those authors are there because it's a collaboratively uh, collected data set. Thank you very much. Well, on the on, on this very creative solution note, I think it's a good uh, time for us to say thank you very much to all of the speakers for your wonderful presentations, for the audience, for your engagement. We hope you found it very useful. Uh, the videos and presentation will be posted um, shortly and you will receive a link. In the meantime, the link in the chat is to the evaluation form. We would really like to ask you to fill out. It's not going to take you more than five minutes, but it will help us tremendously to improve our future events. Thank you very much um, uh, once again and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, Tatiana. And thank you, Tatiana, for all your work you have done on the background. It was very really happy. important. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.